Jesus said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love each other. And by this, all people will know that you are my disciples. During the month of October, the people of Cornerstone United Methodist Church will explore opportunities to become more deeply rooted in the love and grace of God. Together, we'll set personal faith goals around the spiritual practices of prayer, presence, financial gifts, service, and witness. Regardless of your stage of life, may the Holy Spirit inspire you to grow in faith and discipleship this month and in the year to come. Friends, would you pray with me? Lord, we ask that you would open our hearts and minds this morning by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as your scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us. And the people of God said, Amen. Well, if you've been here at all this month, you know that we are devoting the, the month of October to talking about this idea of discipleship, about being rooted in our faith as followers of Jesus Christ. And on the first Sunday of the month, we, we talked about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, and we learned that a disciple is rooted in love. In fact, love is the hallmark of the person who wants to follow Jesus. Love flows through their words and through their actions. Love for God, but also love for other people. And then last Sunday, we explored how a disciple of Jesus is also rooted in hope, right? Right? That no matter what adversity, no matter what challenges or struggles we may face in this world, that we may encounter in this life, followers of Jesus know that God is faithful, that God is bigger than any circumstance or situation we may face in this life. And so today, we're going to take a look at how a follower of Jesus is rooted in discipleship. Now, discipleship is a word that gets used not very much outside of the church, especially outside of the Christian church, but even those within the church are often a little fuzzy about, well, what does this discipleship mean? What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? And what I have found is that some people equate being a Christian with being a disciple. But I think that's akin to calling me a chef when I can put a frozen pizza into the oven, right? Like, they're just not the same thing. You see, disciples of Jesus Christ are Christians, but not all Christians are disciples. Let that kind of ruminate in your mind this week, right? Now, coach and teacher Santa Yinger writes that we are a people who love stories. In fact, she says we are made to hear and to be a part of stories. And often we have this, this visceral reaction, this visceral response when people tell us a good story. We kind of physically lean in to, to hear the storyteller out of curiosity about what they might say next. And pictures and images and, and perhaps even memories and smells and sounds kind of float through our brains as we hear and engage in the stories that are told. Oftentimes, we cheer for the underdog, and we boo at the villains. But stories, they shape us. They impact our view of what could be and what should be. And I think a good story will challenge the way that we see the world and the way that we think the world should work. And so as a follower of Jesus, I think that it means that we are choosing to enter into his story the story of Jesus Christ. And so following Jesus, I think, means we are learning who he is, and we're becoming more like him in both our character and our values. I think following Jesus means ultimately that, that we are joining him in making the kingdom of heaven a reality, not just in the future, but in the present today. But you know, the thing about all of this is that following Jesus also requires something of us, it requires transformation, and it requires a change inside of us, a, a change in how we see the world and how we think it should operate, a, a change in how we see God, 
how we see ourselves and how we see other people. A change in how we determine, well, what is, what is good and right and holy and what is harmful and evil. And you see, all of these are deep, transformative experiences that don't happen overnight. So if you came in here thinking, well, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to walk out a disciple, well, it doesn't work that way, friends. Within the United Methodist Church, though, we believe that being a disciple of Jesus is about actively growing in our love of God and our love of people. And we believe there's a particular way that we go about doing that, and that's through our daily prayers, our regular presence like we are here today in worship. It's through our financial support of the mission and ministry of the local church. It's, it's by serving those who are in need, and it's by bearing witness to God's love and God's grace. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but we lift up these five spiritual practices every single Sunday here at Cornerstone United Methodist Church. Have you noticed that before? Right? And have you noticed that we also lift them up during every baptism, every time that we welcome new members, we collectively renew our vows as a congregation to live into these five practices of prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. And, and maybe, just maybe, you also notice that our 2025 Discipleship Guide is organized around these same five practices. How about that? What a coincidence, right? Why do you think we are so intentional to talk about these over and over and over again? Well, I think the answer to that question is found in today's scripture passage from the book of James. And as Tom read for us, James is a, is a book found in the New Testament or the second half of our scriptures. It's believed to have been written around the end of the first century. Uh, James offers us a blend of ethical advice, uh, practical instruction, and social commentary. And more specifically, in today's scripture, I think the author of James is warning us about having what is known as a passive faith. A passive faith. Now, a person with passive faith welcomes the saving grace of Jesus, welcomes it maybe even with open arms, as long as they don't have to do much in response to that grace, right? A person of passive faith is focused more on what God and the church will do for them than what they are called to do in response to God's saving grace. Now, theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer referred to this as cheap grace. In fact, he said cheap grace is grace without discipleship. It's grace without the cross. It's grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. In contrast, he says, costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again, a gift which must be asked for, the door upon which must be knocked. He says such grace is costly because it calls for us to follow Jesus Christ. Pastor and theologian Aaron Udy explains that on a practical level, someone might say, well, yes, I believe in Jesus, I even believe in the resurrection of Christ, but then their life gives no evidence in their faith. There's no evidence that, that how they treat other people, how they treat people in their community, in their workplaces, in their neighborhoods is any different. And so what does James have to say about this passive faith? Well, he warns us to, to just be doers of the word and not merely hearers not merely hearers who deceive themselves. You see, when we hear the word, but we don't do it, we make up excuses, we say, oh, I'm too busy, or that's meant for somebody else. Church, we deceive ourselves. Now, if you flip the page, the second chapter of James gets even more pointed in his warning against this idea of a passive faith. The author writes, what good is it if someone claims to have faith, but does not have works? He continues, if a brother or sister is naked and they lack daily food and then one of you says to them, well, go in peace, keep warm, eat your fill, but then you don't supply their bodily needs, what good is that? Right? It's just words. There's no action behind it. You haven't done anything to help them. 
And then he concludes with this, what I think is a brutally honest truth, and he says, faith by itself, if it has no works, is what, church? Dead. Dead. Pastor Udy comments that for James, it is really simple. Faith without works is dead. It's not nearly enough to hear the word, but we must do the word. In fact, James promises that hearers and doers will be blessed in their doing. Now, Reverend Dr. Gay Byron writes that before one can fully embrace a working faith, one must cultivate a disciplined life. A disciplined life. And she adds that this disciplined life is a gateway, a gateway to, to wisdom, to humility, and to peace. Now, I want us to contrast this with a passive faith. And a passive faith is knowing that God calls us to, to do things like pray daily, that God calls us to worship regularly, to, to give generously of our treasure, to, to serve those in need, and to bear witness to God's amazing story. It's knowing those things, but a passive faith doesn't respond to them, doesn't take action. A passive faith is one who hears but does not do a passive faith, I think, seeks out the easiest route, the, the way that doesn't take very much time or energy, doesn't require much of my talent or my treasure. A passive faith is, yes, glad that Jesus sacrificed his life for us, but just don't expect me to sacrifice much, if anything, for Jesus. And so church, as your pastor, I want you to hear me this morning when I tell you that these five spiritual practices are critical to your faith journey if you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You see, disciples of Jesus, not just fans like we've talked about, but disciples of Jesus are actively growing in their love of God and their love of other people through these practices, through their prayers, through their presence, through their gifts, through their service, and through their witness. Now, in case you're wondering, disciples of Jesus are not just satisfied with only practicing like two or three of these. It's not like the, the you pick two menu at Panera. You know, I'll give me one and a little side of number three and a smidge of four. It doesn't work that way, church, okay? A disciple of Jesus Christ is working on all five of these practices. But the good thing, the thing that I've come to discover, church, is that the more that I practice these five disciplines of the Christian faith, the more comfortable I become with each of them. The more they become part of who I am and how I live my life. Now, make no mistake, a, a, a disciple of Jesus is far from perfect. They make mistakes. They, they're flawed like everybody else. They're in need of God's love and grace as is everyone. But you see, a disciple of Jesus Christ, the, the distinguishing characteristic, I think, is that they place their desire to love God and to love other people above their own preferences, above their own politics, above their own upbringing, above just about everything else in their life. You see, disciples of Jesus seek to serve Christ and other people in the same way that Jesus did when he was here. Speaking of serving, we had an opportunity recently to ask one of our newer members about their spiritual practice of serving and what that looks like for them, and I invite you to take a look at what they had to share. So my favorite aspect of serving, honestly, is following God's word, right? He asks us to, to give back and to play our part. Um, so being able to use the gifts and the talents that he's given me to be able to serve in a variety of ways is just, I feel like, my little way of, of doing what I, what I am called to do. So how do I feel? Oftentimes I'm feeling very energetic. Um, outside of VBS, when I think we all went home very tired, uh, I, I just I feel energized and ready to go and ready, ready to help out more, ready to serve more. So hands down right now, the most impactful memory that I have right now is that pink tutu from VBS. Um, just seeing the kids look on their face, how much they lit up knowing that 
both myself and probably more importantly Pastor was going to be wearing one as well uh, based on how many boxes of macaroni were brought in. Uh, that, that was for me just, again, it left that lasting impression in their, in their mind. So. so the biggest blessing for me in giving back and serving is just contentment and knowing that uh, I'm not being selfish and keeping to myself what, what I am able to bring, um, that I can, I can serve others and I can help out and just play a small part, in, again, in the big picture of God's kingdom. So God wants us to serve in the church purely so we can share our, share our time and talents with other people. Um, it, it's a way for us to give back, and if we all play our small part, then many hands make light work. So it's important for people to serve in the church because, well, we've talked about how it's what God calls us to do right, to be, to be contributing members and to, to share our time and talents. Uh, but it, it's important that the outside world sees the church as the light of God. And by all of us doing our part and sharing the talents and the time and the treasures that we've been blessed with, it allows us to continue to shine that light for God, right? We don't know what somebody else's path is, but we know that God has put us in their path for a reason. Um, so to be a link in that chain for them um, as they continue their journey and as we continue our journeys on getting to know God more closely. The, the more hands you have doing something, then the easier it is, the, the quicker you can get things done, the more things that you can accomplish, right? Um, and the more, the more expertise that you can bring to the table. If somebody is strong in finances, for example, but never shares that gift, then you've got somebody that doesn't know finance doing finance or running video or whatever it might be. I mean, everybody, everybody has something that they're really passionate about. So to others that aren't serving yet, I would say don't be afraid to make the plunge. It's not a huge commitment. Um, it can be as little as an hour on Sunday mornings. With, well, depending on how, pa how long pastor's sermon goes. Um, it can be as little a commitment as that. It could be a few hours here and there. It's, it doesn't have to be a huge commitment. And it's going to help you feel more connected to the church. It's going to help you feel more connect connected to others just in the community. And you're, you're going to love it. Thank you, David, for that testimony this morning. Friends, I want to be real transparent with you today that that being rooted in discipleship is challenging at times. It's challenging yet holy work. But it's also the most rewarding, the most fulfilling, and I think the most beautiful journey that any of us can embark upon. And you see, by surrendering to God's plans and purposes for our life, I think that we make space. We make space for our own growth. We make space for discovery in our lives. And we make space for God's abundant blessings. Amen? Now, I want to talk to you about something that is very important. Important in your life and important in the life of this church. You see, this week, each of us has an opportunity to, to decide, to choose whether we will be hearers of the Word or whether we will be doers of God's Word. This week, each of us will have an opportunity to, to set aside a passive faith and instead prepare ourselves for a vibrant and active and growing faith. And the way that we do that here at Cornerstone UMC is by setting annual discipleship goals for ourselves using this 2025 Discipleship Guide. Now, if you don't have one, copies are available in the lobby today. Please be sure to pick one up. And one of the things that we do is we set goals for our discipleship, for our faith journey. And the reason we do that is because research shows that if you set a goal and then you write it down, you are three times more likely to achieve that goal. And then if you set a goal, you write it down, and you share it with somebody, that number increases infinitely, friends. And so that's why we practice this at, at Cornerstone UMC. And the goals that are listed on the back page, there's a, a back page that's double-sided, they're organized around the five discipleship practices. How about that, right? Prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. And each of those five practices lists multiple potential goals that you can choose from. 
you can say, okay, I'm going to look at this list, and yeah, I want to set this goal for myself, uh, maybe not this one, but yes, maybe this one. And there's also a blank for other. So if you have a goal you're already working on or a goal God's been nudging you to, you can write that in there. And so church, hear me this morning. My challenge to you this week, this week, there's no other time, this week, okay, is for us to set goals for these five discipleship practices. Now my hope is that we'll have lots of five out of five disciples of Jesus this year. I'm thinking about having buttons made. I'm a five out of five disciple, right? Now, some of you may find that some of the goals are simple and easy to do. But you also may discover that some require some intentionality. Some may even require and ask you to sacrifice a little bit. And so as you set goals for your faith journey, remember that your discipleship is important to God, it is important to this church, and it should be important to you. So once you've written your discipleship goals down on this sheet, you can tear off the back page. And here's the important part. Bring it with you next Sunday. Okay? And if you forget it, I will have extras, but bring it with you next Sunday. If you're not going to be here next Sunday, turn it in this week before you go. Okay? Because what's going to happen next Sunday is we're going to bring them forward. We're going to offer them to God. We're going to bring them forward as an offering. And then we're going to ask... Christ's blessing to be upon our goals, to be upon us as individuals as we seek to achieve these goals, but upon our church so that we can seek to live into these discipleship practices in the year ahead. Now, one more thing. If that wasn't enough, you have a brand new car. No, just kidding. (laughs) Those who set discipleship goals and choose to share them with the church, we're also going to have a special gift from the Holy Land to share with you next Sunday. So friends, I invite us to let us come together, come together in our love of God and in our love of other people, come together in the ways that we pray, come together in the ways that we worship, the ways that we give generously, the ways that we serve, and the ways that we bear witness to God's love and grace. And I want to remind you to never ever forget that that we get to do this together that we have each other, we have this church, that the people around you want to come alongside you on this this beautiful and yet messy journey that we call life. And I think that's some pretty good news. How about you? Thanks be to God.